bom dia, pessoal. Então, hoje nós vamos ter mais um centro de estudos é, sobre vacina, dessa vez sobre vacina contra a, a febre amarela, que é um tema extremamente importante. Né? Ah, estamos com uma equipe, uma, uma, uma mesa muito importante de gente de alto nível, né, do, do, da, da Fiocruz e do, do, da Universidade do Albert Einstein, College de Medicina do, do, de Nova York, que é o professor Kartik Chandra, é, que eles vão falar sobre o, 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 o anticorpos contra a febre amarela. Sobre... Desculpa, gente. É, o doutor, doutor é, Kartik Chandram, Chandram é, vai ser o apresentador do, do seminário. E vai ser debatido pelos colegas do, do Bill Maguinhos, coordenado pela Mirna Bonar. Professor Char Kartik Chandram, muito prazer. Welcome to our, to our Pio Cruz and good present, apresentation. Miriam, pode é, Rafa, pode apresentar os candidatos. Muito obrigada a todos, o pessoal de Bilma Guiz, em especial, um prazer enorme ter aqui também o doutor, o nosso chefe maior da, das vacinas, né, que é o doutor Akira Roma, e que vão fazer, um, que eu tenho certeza que vão fazer um debate muito rico. Muito obrigada a todos. Obrigada, Marli. Bom dia a todos. Então, eu vou apresentar nossos convidados de hoje. O nosso palestrante é o Dr. Kertik Chandran, que é professor de microbiologia e imunologia no Harold and Muriel Faculty Scholar em Virologia na Albert Einstein College of Medicine, em Nova York. O grupo do Dr. Chandran no Einstein descobre e investiga as interações entre vírus emergentes e seus hospedeiros e os explora para desenvolver contramedidas antivirais. Suas principais descobertas incluem receptores de entrada críticos explorados pelos vírus ebola e pelo vírus sem nombre e novos mecanismos pelos quais esses e outros vírus invadem as células. O grupo do Dr. Chandran tem como alvo as interações vírus hospedeiros para ajudar a descobrir um coquetel de anticorpos pan ebola vírus, agora em ensaios clínicos de fase 1 um anticorpo bispecífico pan ebola vírus em desenvolvimento pré-clínico e a projeção de anticorpos monoclonais humanos e bispecíficos eficazes contra dois bunia vírus emergentes letais. Modelos de vírus substitutos desenvolvidos por seu grupo impulsionaram a descoberta de medicamentos e vacinas, avaliação clínica do plasma convalescente contra o COVID-19 e o desenvolvimento de um teste diagnóstico do COVID-19. Quem vai estar aqui mediando a conversa com o Dr. Chandra e que convidou ele é, para estar aqui com a gente é a doutora Mirna Bonaldo, que é graduada em Biologia pela Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, tem mestrado e doutorado em Ciências Biológicas com ênfase em Genética pela Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro também. Atualmente, a doutora Mirna é pesquisadora titular da Fundação Oswaldo Cruz, bolsista de produtividade em desenvolvimento tecnológico e extensão inovadora do CNPq nível 1D. Tem experiência na área de genética e microbiologia, com ênfase em virologia molecular e biotecnologia. Atua em estudos de estrutura e função de genes e proteínas de flavivírus, em especial do vírus da febre amarela e do vírus Zika. Desenvolve vacinas virais recombinantes baseadas na expressão de proteínas de patógenos humanos pelo vírus vacinal da febre amarela 17. Outra abordagem na obtenção de novas vacinas consiste na criação de vírus Zika e SARS-CoV-2 sintéticos que são atenuados por mudanças na frequência do uso de códigos. Então, eu vou passar a palavra para a doutora Mirna, para ela apresentar a dinâmica do nosso Centro de Estudos de hoje. Queria, mais uma vez, agradecer a todos que estão aqui, participando do nosso Centro de Estudos. Uh, Dr. Chandran, thank you very much for being here with us. It's a pleasure to have you here, and I hope you and all the audience enjoy your talk. Thank you very much. Por favor, doutora Mirna, eu queria que você apresentasse, então, a dinâmica e depois passasse a palavra para o doutor Chandran. Obrigada. Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you for attending this lecture today in the Oswaldo Cruz Institute Center of Studies. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Kartik Chandran, for taking the time to be the guest speaker at our seminar. I hope all, all of you find this section exciting. And in my opinion, the data presented by Dr. Chandran will contribute to a better knowledge of the molecular basis of the yellow fever the virus neutralization. Indeed, it can stimulate questions and insights about one of the most used and studied human vaccines, the yellow fever vaccine. 
I want to clarify that after Dr. Chandra's presentation, I will initially invite four colleagues from Biomanguins to comment and discuss the points of this work. Our four debaters have a huge expertise in vaccines and vaccine development, including yellow fever. They work at Biomanguins Field Cruise, and they are Dr. Akira Roma, uh, senior scientist advisor, and one of the best experts in the world in the vaccines and vaccine development. Dr. Tatiana Imarans Noronha, uh, she's an epidemiologist at the clinic advisor department. Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Luciane Gaspar, a senior technologist engaged in vaccine de development studies. And Dr. Marcos Freire, is a scientific advisor with significant experience with flavivirus vaccine development. Thank you very much for agreeing to participate in this meeting. And uh, in, after the debater's remarks, I will open the discussion uh, to the audience through the question put on the chat of the IOC channel. Dr. Kartik Shannon, welcome to Scientific Forum, and feel free to start your presentation now. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. I um, really uh, appreciate the invitation to, to present um, this work, and especially I'd like to thank Dr. Bonaldo, um, who invited me to speak, and I'm really excited about the discussion afterwards and hoping to learn uh, from all of you as well, since you have a lot of expertise in the vaccine and Really uh, looking forward to the discussion. I'm going to share my screen. I hope that goes well. Let's see. Can you see my slides? Okay. It's okay. Okay, great. Yes, um, we can see. So yes. today I'm going to, that's good. Um, I'm going to tell you about uh, some work that we've done recently uh, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Bonaldo as well as uh, Dr. Esper Callas. Um, as, and uh, other collaborators that I'll introduce later on um, that are, are really looking at the, um, the neutralizing antibody response to yellow fever vaccination in humans. Um, so I don't think, I, you know, I certainly don't need to introduce yellow fever to this group, so I, I will do this um, pretty quickly. So yellow fever, of course, is a um, you know, of an, an infection and a disease that's been with us for, for a very long time. And um, developing the yellow fever vaccine is really one of the early triumphs of uh, virology and public health uh, in the 20th century. Um, the, the virus that, the, the vaccine that is really being used essentially all over the world today is based on a, a live attenuated uh, yellow fever virus that is called YF17D. Um, which uh, was derived by serial passage and attenuation from the African ACB strain. Um, this is in, you know, regarded by many as the most successful vaccine ever made and is thought to give a lifelong or at least long-term protection um, against in, uh, severe disease at, at the very least. Um, you know, so one of the challenges with yellow fever, of course, is that in the eyes of many, this is seen as a solved problem, but we know, and, and you all know better than most other people, that that's not really true, um, that yellow fever continues to be a big problem, um, both in, in, in Africa um, and other endemic areas in, in, in Europe and Asia, but also mostly in, um, in, in Africa, um, but also in South America, where you've seen um, recent outbreaks that have uh, uh, certainly created uh, public health challenges. And one of the, the public health challenges, of course, is the limit, is the sort of availability of the vaccine. Um, there's, in general, uh, not enough doses available. And I know that, um, you know, your institution is a, a site for manufacturing a variant of the vaccine, 17DD, which is obviously of uh, incredible importance from a public health standpoint. Um, and, you know, one of the sort of challenges that this has contributed to as well, that that you know would be worth discussing afterwards, um, and I would love to hear the experts' thoughts on on this issue. Um, the the issue of fractional dosing to stretch doses of uh, vaccine. Now, obviously, in the long term, the solution would be to have enough vaccine to give full doses and even potentially to boost people 
Um, but, uh, you know, we, we are wondering to what extent some of these public health measures that are, of course, done because they're necessary, um, you know, play into some of the results that I'm going to show you, um, and which we can talk about later. So um, recently, the World Health Organization, WHO, declared why, uh, yellow fever eradication as a major goal. The goal is to sort of over a, you know, a 10 year period to eliminate yellow fever epidemics. Now, of course, the largest uh, number of cases are happening in African countries, um, but you know, this is also an, an ongoing sort of uh, emerging, re-emerging issue in, in South America, especially in Brazil, as you all are aware, very well aware better than me. So, um, you know, vaccination and immune surveillance are really central to the public health strategy against yellow fever. Um, and so the, the idea is to vaccinate as many people as possible um, and to have plans, you know, in order to be able to um, do emergency vaccinations during outbreaks, which I know has happened um, in Brazil and elsewhere. Um, but then to sort of really build up that capacity to be able to respond uh, and, and to come and sort of couple that with routine vaccination surveillance and diagnostics. The, the goal, of course, in the long term is to really build health systems capacity and resilience through ongoing surveillance, through risk assessment, and through refining um, how we prevent and treat uh, infections. So although a lot has been done, there's obviously a lot more to do, not just for yellow fever, but a lot of other um, viruses, especially emerging viruses um, that either we don't know about yet or that are we know about but that tend to uh, emerge and re-emerge into human populations. So again, of course, this is, you know, the um, this is, is an expression in, uh, in English about hauling colds to Newcastle, for those of you who are familiar with that, but the idea is basically, I don't need to tell you anything about this outbreak or a series of um, outbreaks that Brazil has experienced over the, the last few decades, but especially this one, uh, which was uh, really the largest that you've seen in 80 years, and that is believed to have been maintained um, really by a jungle cycle between non-human primates and sylvatic mosquitoes in the Amazon basin, rather than really being spread by a, an urban cycle. Um, I'm just going to hide this. And it is, it's thought that the infection is um, primarily spread to people from sylvatic mosquitoes, but of course, there is a concern about increasing risk of urban cycles mediated by Aedes mosquitoes. Um, so uh, that's sort of the backdrop for, for the work that I'm going to present today, which is um, quite molecular, but I think maybe has these larger public health implications that I would love to, to discuss with, with, uh, with the group after and to, to take questions on. So uh, yellow fever virus is a flavivirus. Um, it's a member of this large family of viruses that includes many important a human uh, pathogen, important arboviruses such as dengue virus, um, Zika virus, and um, you know, Japanese encephalitis are many viruses in this family that are associated with human disease. Um, this is a plus strand RNA virus um, with a non-segmented genome and uh, which encodes a, a single polyprotein that undergoes a series of complex um, post-translational uh, proteolytic processing events to generate the uh, the individual viral proteins and to allow um, cells to become infected and generate um, to replicate the viral RNA and assemble viral particles that are released from cells and can go on to infect new cells. <coughs> but for the purposes of um, my remarks today, we're really just going to focus on one set of proteins, the the, the PRME uh, glycoprotein complex, which um, re which is generating this glycoprotein called E that is on the surface of the virus particles and makes these organized structures that I'm going to show you in, uh, in a couple of seconds. And uh, this E protein is, is crucial because not only is it the, the machine in the virus that allows the virus to infect new cells by fusing the membrane of the virus with the membrane of the cell, but is also the major target of neutralizing antibodies, which are central uh, to my talk. So one of the hallmarks of all flaviviruses, uh, including yellow fever, um, is that the virus particles, once they're assembled, can occur in different states that have to do with states of the, the glycoprotein the, or the PRME glycoprotein complex that um, 
makes the that is on the surface of the, the virus. So just a, a, a quick bit of recap, the, the RNA uh, genome is encapsulated um, by, uh, is, is enclosed in a viral membrane and um, flaviviruses don't really have a capsid protein. Instead, the, the structure of the particle is really caused, is created by the organization of the, the viral glycoprotein complexes. Um, as the virus is assembling, it initially makes this immature form that has these spike projections of PRME complexes in the in the endoplasmic the reticulum or ER of the cell. Um, but as the virus particle transits through the secretory pathway and goes to the trans-Golgi network or TGN, there is a proteolytic cleavage and other acid-dependent conformational changes which allow the the PRM to be cleaved and to PR and release the M peptide. And this actually causes these E. Uh, to, to sort of collapse onto the particle uh, and not no longer form these spiky projections, but form a much more flat um, surface to the particle. And E forms these dimers on the surface that I'm going to show you in a few slides. Um, so as the virus exits the cell and is exposed to a neutral uh, pH, as it goes from acid to neutral pH, the PR protein that is still bound to the E dimer is released. Um, and, and leaves the M peptide there still in the membrane. And uh, this is the final mature extracellular virus particle that goes on to, to infect uh, new cells. So this is why this is another view of the virus particle. This is a pseudo-atomic sort of uh, structure of the entire virus particle. And what you're seeing here is a single dimer of the E protein that's been highlighted. Um, and so just a couple of things. So first of all, you, you can see that these E dimers which are sort of the basic unit of the glycoprotein are arranged in these raft-like structures um, by sort of like planks of wood, you know, lined up in the water, which is why it's called it like a raft. Um, and uh, these raft-like structures are what really forms the structure of the of the particle. And you, you'll notice that these uh, proteins are also, so here you're actually looking at two different dimers that are kind of uh, arranged in this parallel uh, arrangement um, like a raft. And these are colored according to domain structure, which is sort of, you know, uh, conserved among all flaviviruses E proteins. Uh, and the convention is to color them as uh, in red, yellow, and blue like this. Um, and so you have basically the central region of the, of the E protein called domain two that really forms the body uh, of the central body of the dimer and the central body of the raft. Um, and it is if, you know, in the in the sort of the three dimensional structure of the dimer, flanked by uh, domain one shown in red and domain three uh, uh, shown in blue. So this is sort of how the uh, the E dimer is organized. And here's a, your twofold axis of symmetry uh, within the dimer, and then here's a twofold axis of symmetry between the dimers. So um, this is just uh, I, I just wanted to introduce this to you, um, just to kind of orient you to a lot of the slides that are coming that really have to do with how the, uh, um, you know, mutations in the virus particle are affecting antibodies. So, of course, this protein, as I already mentioned, the E protein mediates attachment of the virus to the cells and fusion of the viral envelope, membrane envelope with that of the endosomes of the cells and uh, it allows the viral RNA to escape into the cytoplasm where it can then take over the cell and make more virus particles. And again, as I mentioned earlier, um, but it, it's helpful to reiterate that the E protein is also the major target of the neutralizing antibody response, which is a key uh, correlate of vaccine mediated protection. Although probably not the only one, and this is something we should discuss. So um, sort of the prologue to this work was the uh, sort of a, 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 an observation uh, or even a hypothesis, if you will, that yellow fever strains circulating in South America are genetically distinct from their African counterparts. And this is something that has come out of uh, a lot of work that's been done by your institute, including Dr. Bonaldo, especially uh, looking at genetic changes um, in various viral genes and open reading frames uh, that were associated with these newer clades of viruses, especially this virus called ES4, or this isolate called ES4, that uh, was isolated from uh, during the um, this this most recent outbreak uh, in Brazil and has been isolated multiple times. So essentially, this seems to be a dominant genotype that's arisen, and it has a number of mutations in non-structured proteins that Dr. Bonaldo and others have uh, char are characterizing and have published on. 
Uh, but um, and so there's, of course, a lot of interest in these genetic changes and how they may affect changes, potential changes in the virulence of yellow fever, its ability to spread um, you know, from mosquitoes to people and then to cause disease. Um, but one question that we felt hadn't really been addressed as extensively was this question of genetic diverse divergence in the e-glycoprotein rather than the non-structural proteins and how the, you know, if there was genetic divergence in the e-protein, how could that potentially affect the, the activity of vaccine-induced neutralizing antibodies? So, so, you know, we were just wondering whether, you know, what, what the e-protein looks like uh, in South American uh, yellow fever virus strains and whether that, you know, really has any uh, impact on the kind of antibodies that are generated by the YF17D or 17DD vaccines, which of course are based on an African or old world uh, viral strain. Um, you know, had there been genetic drift, had there been sort of adaptive evolution in the e-protein in South America that might affect this. And so that was sort of our question going in. Um, and so, you know, the way we actually started out the study, uh, you know, was to really look at a longitudinal analysis of antibody response to vaccination. And initially we were looking at uh, US volunteers that had been selected because they were naive to flaviviruses. And this is of course a big issue whenever you study flaviviruses since, uh, especially the immune response, since um, there are so many flaviviruses circulating uh, in, in, in human populations. And there are similarities among these E proteins that cause certain shared antibodies to be elicited. So um, it was sort of important to, to find people um, who hadn't been exposed to flavies before. And that was, of course, relatively straightforward to do in the Northeast of the United States as compared to many other places in the world. Um, I mean, I'm from India originally, and I can tell you that, you know, in the last 20 years, dengue has become extremely endemic. So in urban areas, it's very difficult to find people who don't have any flavy or dengue exposure. But in Vermont or New Hampshire in the Northeast of the United States, this is much less of an issue. Um, and before I start showing you some data, I wanted to uh, just share a little bit about uh, an important methodological tool that we have used for many studies, which is a uh, West Nile virus-based uh, reporter viral particle or uh, RVP system. And so West Nile virus is another flavivirus um, that is an emerging virus. And, um, you know, it's a very robust virus that in terms of replication. And so what Ted Pearson uh, did a number of years ago uh, who is now at NIH, um, is essentially take the West Nile virus genome um, and engineer it to, to essentially delete the glycoproteins and generate a, a virus that only essentially had this, the, the non-structural proteins, but also had this, the cis sequences for packaging uh, of this, um, you know, the sort of uh, subgenomic uh, structure. And this is driven by a, a cytomegalovirus promoter um, so that, you know, essentially it could, it could be transcribed in cells. And so essentially this is a, a subgenomic replicon that if you introduce the RNA into the cell or make, introduce DNA that can be transcribed to RNA, that this can actually replicate within the cells. Um, but of course it cannot spread from cell to cell because it doesn't have the PRME glycoprotein complex that's needed for viral uh, release and for entry into new cells. But what you can do then is, um, first thing you can do is you can introduce some kind of reporter gene. And the system that we got from Ted had a GFP reporter. So we can actually look at viral replication and infection by looking for GFP um, uh, expression in, in, in target cells. And we can introduce the PRME glycoproteins um, in trans by, uh, from a plasmid. And essentially what this does is generate single cycle uh, reporter virus particles that are packaging this this subgenomic replicon from West Nile virus with the reporter gene, and on their surface, the virus particles have this PRME protein that um, that we can and we can express whatever we want here, and as long as it works for viral uh, release, uh, budding release and infection, um, you know we can we can make mutations in this. We can use a yellow fever glycoprotein, which is what we've done here. Um, and it's a very nice system to study these viruses in BSL-2 because, of course, uh, in order to work with uh, any yellow fever strain that's an authentic uh, virulent strain that's not a vaccine strain, uh, we have to do it in BSL-3, and we are only now just getting our BSL-3. So, uh, but of course, we have a lot of data with uh, with real virus, real viruses that um, Dr. Bonaldo's lab 
um, and um, and other collaborators uh, group uh, um, have uh, generated, and I'll share that with you as well. But a lot of the experiments that we've done that I'm going to show you are with this RVP system. So I just want to introduce that to you before I started sharing the data. Um, and so these data, in, the, uh, in this experiment, we essentially recruited, as I mentioned, these three different donors uh, in the US that were not exposed to flaviviruses. And then we vaccinated them with the YF17D virus. Um, and this is in collaboration with Laura Walker's group at Adimab, which is a biotech company in New Hampshire. Um, and so, uh, and then we essentially, uh, uh, you know, uh, took blood from these, uh, you know, we, we blood these individuals, we um, collected blood from these individuals, and we essentially looked at the serum and its neutralizing activity in terms of the antibodies that are present against uh, different RVPs containing different E proteins. Um, and so what you see here across the board, and here you can see this is days post vaccination. So this is at the very beginning where there's a very low neutralizing antibody response. But as we go to 360 days, um, so one year, uh, we see, first of all, uh, over the first month or so, a nice spike uh, in the neutralizing antibodies, and then it sort of stays flat and high. So it's a strong and sustained neutralizing response versus old world strains from, from Africa, um, because again, the 17D E protein is derived from SCB, um, and China is actually an, uh, is also a, an, uh, an African strain, basically, where somebody traveled to China carrying this. So, so these are all old world E proteins. And what we see is a nice neutralizing response that comes up early and stays high for the most part. And there is some variation among, among individuals. Uh, and then just to, again, orient you to the data, what you're looking at here is an IC50 for neutralization. But um, we can talk about the details later if you like. But the most important thing to sort of just remember here is that the higher the number, the higher the neutralizing activity. Um, so you're starting with the low neutralizing activity, as you expect in these people, because they've never seen a flavor virus before. And then when you vaccinate them, now you get a nice response. Um, however, when you do the same experiment um, in these with these blood samples from back, from from 17D vaccinees, and you look at RVPs containing the ES504 E protein, you see something quite different, which is basically a greatly blunted or reduced neutralizing response. So first of all, it never goes up as high. And then it stays low. Um, so essentially, what we noticed, which is quite striking in this first in these first experiments, was that um, uh, when you vaccinate people who haven't been exposed to flaviviruses before with the yellow fever vaccine, they make a strong response against African strains. And of course, we haven't looked at all the African strains, but we think this is likely to be the case uh, with with many or most African strains. However, when you look at ES five hundred four, we see a much reduced response. Um, it was important, of course, to do two things, to do this with real uh, flavivirus, yellow fever, not just these RVP particles. And it was also important to look in Brazil with the real virus and in Brazilian vaccines. And this is where uh, our collaboration with Dr. Bernaldo um, and also with Dr. Callas became really important um, because uh, through them, uh, through their, that collaboration, they were able, and working closely with us, um, they were able to test their um, uh, uh, essentially, a very similar experiment in that cohort. Uh, in this case, five donors, uh, and uh, in, in, in this case, Dr. Bernaldo's group is looking at real yellow fever virus, both the vaccine strain as well as um, ES504. And so, what you see is again something very comparable. There are differences. So, for example, donor six has a much stronger response, as does donor seven. Uh, we don't really know why. It could be because they have uh, prior exposure to other viruses, other flaviviruses, for example. Um, and of course, this is, a, this is a milieu where people are maybe exposed to other viruses as well. So, um, you know, so that's a bit complicated because um, these individuals weren't necessarily screened to be um, uh, flavivirus naive. So that said, uh, in three out of these five donors, we saw something quite similar to what we saw with the US donors. Um, and so this is just the same data, but this time I'm just showing you day 14 and day 360 uh, with the same three donors in the US and the same uh, uh, five donors um, in, in, in Brazil. And you can see again that in general, the responses to ES504 early and late are quite um, post vaccination are quite low against ES504 uh, as much as uh, several hundred fold uh, lower, um, you know, uh, depending on, on the individual. Um, so a broadly similar results seen. 
So, you know, of course, this is looking at very few people. So we want to expand this to a much larger pool of vaccinees. Um, and so we, and what I'm showing you here is a, the sort of summary of those results. So when we look at, um, and we're again looking at two cohorts in collaboration with uh, Dr. Bonaldo and, and Kellis, um, we're looking at US donors and Brazilian donors, and we're looking at neutralization. So each, each point here is a person, and this is a neutralizing titer. Um, and um, so essentially, and th these are people that were in many cases vaccinated a while earlier. Um, so um, we have dates on all of these, but I've sort of left this out um, just for simplicity. Um, and so you can see again, a nice distribution of, of neutralizing activity. These people weren't all sampled at the same time. So there's some variation there. Um, and we see very similar numbers with the Brazilian coordinate. This is very encouraging as well, because we're using two completely different assays here. Um, in the with with the uh, report of our particle system here in New York, we're using just GFP, and then uh, Dr. Bonaldo's group um, um, is using a real yellow fever and doing an, a, a fluorescent uh, uh, sort of a, like an FRNT, which is um, sort of like a, like a focus reduction neutralization test. So just a, a different assay. And we see very, and these are completely different people in two different countries getting slightly different versions of the vaccine. So it was actually very, made, made us very happy to see that the data look very similar, even in terms of the titers uh, that we saw. Um, and we see a little bit of reduction with SCB um, in, in the US cohort. But what's really striking again is what happens with ES504, in this case with just the E protein on West Nile particles, in this case with real ES504, you can see again, um, a difference, a, a, you know, a quite a large difference that's consistent with the data I showed you on the last couple of slides with a much fewer uh, number of people. Um, and a, another striking thing is that although there is some variability, so you can see here that there are a few people that mounted strong responses. Um, and just, you know, by way of complete disclosure, you know, I have tested, you know, or, uh, Denise in my lab and uh, Alex have drawn my blood and tested me. And I have high titers against ES504 as well, which we don't really know why. It could be, I have gotten the yellow fever vaccine a number of years ago, but it could be because I was exposed to dengue previously. Anyway, so I think we expect some human to human variation and some of that has to do with prior exposure, but there may be other factors as well. Nevertheless, it was quite striking how uniform the reductions were in these titers uh, uh, against the, of neutralizing activity against ES504 versus these African uh, sequences. So, uh, of course, you know, my lab really specializes in molecular biology and genetics of viruses. So this is a perfect opportunity for us to really start digging into what is the molecular basis of this difference. Um, and so um, one clue we got was by looking at the activity of a large panel of monoclonal antibodies. And these are monoclonal antibodies that came from the same donors in the US were isolated by B cell sorting um, by our collaborator, Laura Walker's group at Adimab. So this is a previous paper that uh, we'd collaborated with them on, and it was really the genesis actually in many ways of the work that I'm presenting today. Um, and you know, my, my, my uh, research fellow, Denise uh, Hasselwander noticed this very interesting difference and pursued it, um, but it was a, almost like a fortuitous discovery, which is often how science happens if the informed, uh, prepared mind can catch something interesting. And that's what Denise did. So, um, but we did have all these monoclonal antibodies. And so when we looked at their ability to neutralize um, these different RVPs, we noticed again, the same pattern that we saw with patient or donor sera from vaccinees, which is uh, a very nice reduction in the neutralization activity uh, uh, against the ES504. Well, I wouldn't call it very nice, but you know, from a lab standpoint, it's very nice. Uh, not what you want to see, of course. Um, and we see very similar results with the CD and 17D, which is what we'd expect. And um, we sent the, these monoclonal antibodies uh, to our collaborators. Um, and they also saw, um, with a smaller group of these antibodies, a very, very nice reduction um, in neutralizing activity with these monoclonal antibodies. So the monoclonal antibodies that we've isolated from, uh, these are from YF17D vaccinated donors, um, you know, really does re kind of recapitulate what we're seeing with sera. So a lot of antibodies that we get against the vaccine strain don't seem to be able to neutralize ES504 very well. Um, so those were with uh, all of the antibodies or many antibodies we had binding to different places on the E protein. But what happens if we look only at specific 
uh, antibodies that, that only bind to specific parts of the EPRI. And we know this because we've actually gone in and mapped the, the binding, uh, very roughly the binding epitopes or footprints of these antibodies on the E protein. Um, and so what we, what Denise was able to do was to essentially look only at domain two specific, uh, neutralizing antibodies. And so, and I'm not showing you all the data here in the interest of time. Um, for example, domain three antibodies don't show this behavior. But what was really striking again is domain two antibodies, um, you know, really look like all of the antibodies and look like this, the, the CIRA, which is to say that they work really well in neutralizing 17D and SCB, but they don't neutralize ES504 very well at all. So the domain two antibodies look like the CIRA. That's the important conclusion. And again, with authentic uh, yellow fever virus strains, we see exactly the same thing. So what this suggested, but didn't prove was that domain two is really the, the reason why there's a difference between the vaccine strain and ES504 in neutralization. There's something different about the domain two subunit. At least that was our hypothesis. Um, and so just to sort of remind you of where domain two is, here's the particle, here's one E-dimer and here are two E-dimers right next to each other. And so the domain two is this yellow domain that makes the body, the central body of the these rafts um, on the surface of the, the viral particles. So the next question was, can we determine the genetic basis of this effect, this loss in ES504 neutralizing activity, right? And so in order to do this, uh, Denise took the approach of making genetic chimeras, which is a very powerful approach. Doesn't always work, but in this case, um, you know, fortune favors the brave and she was able to really get this to work. And the approach here is basically, and, and this is just a cartoon showing you like schematically what we did. Um, here is 17D, he is ES504 with the stripes. The colors are according to the three different domains. Um, red is domain one, yellow is domain two, and blue is domain three. And one thing you can see from here is that even though these domains make single structures in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the folded protein, in the linear sequence, they're, they're discontinuous because this chain isn't folding from one end to the other. It's forming a complex three dimensional state shape where segments are going back and forth. And that's why you're seeing that domain two is split into two pieces and domain one is actually split into three pieces. But I mean, that's not critical for this talk. I just, in case you're wondering about that, you're not familiar with this type of diagram. I just want to point that out. The most important thing for you to, to sort of like pay attention to here though, is what we're doing here with these two proteins. And what Denise did is essentially to exchange pieces of these proteins to make chimeras. And so in this, in this chimera, for example, um, we took 17D and we put domain one from ES504. And you can see that only the red, uh, the, dom the red pieces went from plain to, to striped. That's because this is now a chimera that has only domain one. And so she did the same thing with the other domains. And then she did the reciprocal chimeras where she took ES504 and she put in domains from 17D. So she has it in both directions to see what, what happens when you exchange pieces of the, the glycoprotein. And what I'm showing you here is really just a summary of a lot of work and a lot of data that, that she and Alex in the lab generated. And again, the same kind of graph, you're looking at neutralization, higher the better. And again, we're looking at donor sera. Um, and so what you see here is that um, there's really only one strong conclusion you can make, which is that when you take 17D, the vaccine strain, and you replace its domain two with the domain two of ES504, you get a very nice reduction in neutralization, right? And when you do the opposite experiment, it's not as strong. Um, when we take ES504, so this is what you might call a loss of function experiment. Can we break neutralization of 17D? Can we make a virus resistant to neutralization um, by, or I mean, it depends on how you think about it. You could think of it as a gain of function too. But anyway, if you think of resistance as gain of function, but that's just semantics. The main point here is if you take ES504 domain two and put it in 17D, you lose neutralization. If you do the opposite experiment, we start with ES504, right, which is not neutralized well at all. So it's starting low. Um, and then you, you start to replace the different segments. The only segment here that really makes a huge difference is domain two. It doesn't go completely back to the wild type level of neutralization, which suggests there's some more complicated things happening, which we can discuss later. But it does suggest that domain two is the sort of the key player. Uh, and again, the arrows are just to remind me to point. So, um, so what's different about domain two, right? And this is where uh, a, a senior uh, member of my lab, uh, Gor Kalasa, who is a computational biologist, really comes in into this project. Well, he was doing a lot of other things too that I'm not telling you about. 
uh, today, but this was one of his key contributions to this project, um, which was to really realize that there are these quite conserved differences between the old world and the new world strains. Uh, and I'll show you more of that data uh, in a few slides. But the most important conclusion is that you can distill these changes that are conserved among the old world versus the new world strains into two sites. And so uh, just to orient you, the top three here are African strains, the bottom two are South American strains. So Brazil, which is an ES504, which is a genotype one strain, for those of you who are familiar with that, with that sort of nomenclature, and Bolivia 99, which is a, a genotype two strain, slightly different. Um, and so what uh, Gorka noticed is that um, essentially there is a polymorphism at site in, at this one site in the N-terminal part of domain two, which we also know is a crucial site for recognition of certain classes of antibodies that bind near the fusion loop, exemplified by an antibody called 5A, which was isolated by George Gao's group in Beijing a few years ago. And they have a structure of this and where it's bound to the E protein. And the pink is the footprint of this antibody. So it was quite intriguing that site one is sort of right there and already suggested that maybe there's some kind of neutralization uh, escape process happening. Um, but what was really even more interesting, at least to me, was this other site uh, almost at the end of domain two, which we call site two. It's not very creative, I know, but it's helpful to, to have simple, simple names. Um, and there were two things that, that Gorka noticed. So first of all, he noticed that there is actually this, there's a mutation from an Espera gene at 271 to serine. And that creates an NXS motif, which is a glycosyl, N-linked glycosylation motif, or what's called a sequon, S-E-Q-U-O-N, -E sequon. And essentially, this is a site for N-linked glycosylation. And, you know, for many, many years, and you look in the literature, people always talk about yellow fever E protein as not being glycosylated. There's a lot of interest in N-linked glycosylation of flavivirus E proteins with dengue, with Zika. There are differences between different strains. There's a lot of work on this, but you look at review articles, people always talk about E protein not being glycosylated. Now that's not completely true as Myrna will tell you because it turns out that 17DD actually has an N-linked site um, elsewhere in the protein. I'm not getting into that today. But um, that seems to be relatively unique to 17DD versus some of the other, uh, you know, it doesn't seem to be a clade thing. It seems to be more of an individual virus thing. Nevertheless, the key point here is that um, in both Bolivia and Brazil, there is a creation of an N-linked glycosylation site. Uh, and interestingly, the sequence is not exactly the same. In, Brazil, in ES504, it's NNS, and in Bolivian strain, it's NGS, which is quite interesting as well. And then there's one additional change, which is an asparagine to a lysine shown in red that's only present in ES504. So there were these two sites that, including one uh, set of changes that created this NXS site, which for, for glycosylation. Now, of course, just because a site is there doesn't mean it's used for glycosylation. Maybe it's, it's not used because it's buried or some other reason. Um, so we, you know, we want to look more into that and I'll show you on the next couple of slides. But first we looked at site one and, and this is just showing you visually what I was telling you earlier, which is that there are these two amino acid changes between the old world and the, and, and the ES504 that are at 83 and 67. And basically this is right in this contact surface on the E-dimer for this an neutralizing antibody called 5A. Um, and consistent with that, what uh, Denise found was that um, when you look at uh, domain two neutralizing monoclonal antibodies uh, that we got from donors um, that had been vaccinated, um, when you make the chimera where you take, um, you, you essentially only replace site one, um, you know, so not the whole domain two, but just that, that little one site one change, like essentially two amino acids between 17D and ES504, and you introduce the ES504 sequence into the 17D, now you, you lose neutralization. I mean, it doesn't go to zero, but because not all these antibodies are susceptible to this change, but many of them are, and so you see this nice reduction. And when you do the opposite experiment, where you take ES504 and you put in the 17D site one, now you see an increase in neutralization. So this basically told us that site one, uh, you know, this, this genetic difference between 17D and ES504 makes a huge difference for neutralizing of these antibodies that bind to this particular site. And there's a lot of them. So this is, seems to be quite a prevalent epitope that's targeted. However, what was really interesting was when you take the same site one chimeras and you look with 
donor sera. So now we're not looking at monoclonal antibodies, we're looking at polyclonal sera from, from vaccinated people, right? Now we see something very different, which is that this site one change makes absolutely no difference. So what this is telling us is that even though we got monoclonal antibodies from vaccinated people that are affected by this site one change, when you actually look at the serum neutralization, there's no effect, which tells us that there are a lot of antibodies in serum that are binding somewhere else or not affected by this change. Um, some of them could be site one antibodies that are not affected by these amino acid changes. As I showed you on the previous slide, there are site one antibodies, uh, sort of, uh, there are antibodies like 5A that are not affected by these changes because it's maybe binding a little bit differently. Um, however, um, you know, that doesn't seem to be the dominant thing that's going on here, which really got us thinking about what is site two doing? And if site one isn't that important for this reduced neutralization we're seeing after vaccination, then, then what's explanation? Is site two important? Um, so to look at that, we, we, we sort of separated out or teased apart the site two changes even a little bit more. Um, and so we actually looked at site two, but we also made two subsites, site two A, oops, um, which basically is splitting um, this, sorry, um, which is splitting this glycosylation site and site two B, which is only splitting this N and K change. And I'll show you the data for that. So um, the first question we asked is, is this site glycosylated, right? Because that's not a given that, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, you know, the site might be there, but not used by the glycosylation machinery for different reasons. Um, and so the, the short answer is yes, the site is highly gly is, is glycosylated. And we know that by mass spectrometry, I'm not gonna show you all the details here, but the main point here is when we look at a recombinant E protein, this is not virus, this is a, an express protein. Um, we see that uh, when we look at 70, a CB, which is green, we see 100% of it is not glycosylated. So there is no glycan, so it says unoccupied here. However, when you look at ES504 E protein, almost all of it is glycosylated and has some form of glycosylation um, elaboration of an a N-glycan chain here. Uh, and you can see here that the unoccupied is zero. So at least in a recombinant E protein, this site is used quite efficiently for glycosylation. And this is work that we did in collaboration with Simone Sedoli here at Einstein, who's a mass spectrometrist. Um, but of course, that's not virus, that's that's recombinant protein. So Alex Say, actually in my lab, who's a, a, a student, actually did a lot of work um, to actually prove, try and prove that this was glycosylated um, in the virus particle. And so to do this, she's doing Western blots with uh, RVPs where she's blotting for the E protein. And she's using an enzyme called protein and glycosidase F, which is abbreviated here as PF. And essentially what this protein, the enzyme does is it removes the N-glycan chains and causes a molecular shift in the way the protein runs on the gel if it's glycosylated. If it's not glycosylated, there's no change. And you see that there's no change with a CB, which, it, which just proves that it's not glycosylated, uh, the E protein. And we know the enzyme is working because she did the same experiment with Ebola GP and we see a very nice shift. And we know, of course, that Ebola GP is very highly glycosylated. Um, However, when she did the same experiment with ES504 RVPs, she sees a nice shift. She sees a doublet, which suggests that this glycosylation site isn't completely used in the virus, which is interesting and something that we need to follow up and understand. Uh, but it is glycosylated because when we add the enzyme, it all goes down to this lower band. And very importantly, when Myrna's group did exactly the same experiment with real yellow fever, she sees almost exactly the same thing, which is very, which is, again, makes me very happy. So it really, this is, proving that even in the virus particle, the, this glycosylation site is used, okay? Uh, so what, what is the effect of this glycosylation site? So first of all, when we make these same chimeras, but only for site two, what we see is the whole site two, which has both of these changes, both the glycosylation site and this N to K or asparagine to lysine change, we see a very nice reduction in neutralization. So, and this is with serum, not with monoclonal antibodies. So this is telling us that site two is very important in terms of evading serum neutralization. And when we split the site two into two subsites, site two A, which only has a glycosylation site, we actually see an effect, although it's not the major effect. The major effect comes from the single amino acid change N to K in site two B, but together they have this nice effect. So really both sites, but especially site two B drive the loss of neutralization by vaccinated sera. And what's really intriguing is when you look at where these changes are, they are actually, and, and one possibility, of course, that Gorka just mentioned to me yesterday was, hey, maybe this NTK change is affecting glycosylation at the site. And that's something we should look at as well. So there's a lot more work to do at the molecular level, but 
what we think may be happening is that these changes are at this hinge between domain one and domain two that kind of allows these domains to move. And we think these light planes breathe uh, naturally. And so that breathing motion or the dynamics of it might be affected in such a way that prevents antibodies from binding. And so, uh, and what Gorka also showed by modeling is that although we've never isolated, nobody's really isolated these kind of antibodies for yellow fever, um, what uh, Gorka showed is that when you look at antibodies that are binding to other flaviviruses uh, that are binding quaternary epitopes, like, so these are antibodies that don't bind to the recombinant protein just that's floating in solution, but only bind to the virus particle, um, many of those antibodies actually can overlap with the site um, that we've identified that has the site two changes. So it's possible that one thing's happening here is that by having these, these amino acid changes and, and the addition of a glycosylation sequence or the glycosylation site, that these there are yellow fever antibodies that are binding in this place on the virus that cannot bind anymore and so they can't neutralize. But it's also possible that there's something more complicated going on that, and we think that's probably a mixture of the two things is that the glycoprotein is breathing normally. And when we make these mutations, maybe it's breathing more or breathing less, and that is affecting the antibody binding. And you would expect that antibodies that bind to these quaternary, more complex surfaces on the virus would be more effective than antibodies that are just binding to the fusion loop or some kind of like linear sequence. Um, finally, what I wanted to show you is that these sequences are not unique to ES504. In fact, they're highly conserved among South American strains. So this is a tree um, that Gorka built looking at both old world and new world viruses. And it's, it's, there's a lot going on, so I'll just simplify it or I'll just summarize it for you. The blue is African strains, um, and the orange and yellow is South America. Uh, this, this fawn color is uh, South American strains. And so you can see, of course, that all of the African strains cluster together. The, the genotype one, uh, mostly Brazilian, but a couple of other strains here from Caribbean, Venezuela. Um, also cluster, and then a, a much fewer number of these genotype two strains, which includes um, uh, Bolivia, the uh, Bolivia 99 that, that cluster together. So everything sort of clusters as it should. But now when you start looking at the variants in domain two, you see something very interesting, which is that uniformly all of the old world strains, all the African strains have, you know, this, the, 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 what we would call the, the wild type you know, uh, it's not really, but you know what I mean. It, it's the African sequence, which um, is present in the vaccine strain also, and represents the binding site for all these type one antibodies, right? So they have it. However, when you look at uh, South American strains, you see that um, these open squares, so basically all of the genotype one strains have a mutation at site one. However, this, the genotype two strains are intermediate at this locus. So they actually have, they look more like the African strains uh, at site one. What happens at site two? Well, at site two, there is no glycosylation site or this N2K change in any of the African strains. So again, they are highly uniform. Um, and similarly, the South American strains are highly uniform, but in the opposite direction. All of them have, are predicted to be glycosylated, although, as I mentioned, there's a slight difference between the genotype one and two strains in the sequence, but the prediction is there for the glycosylation. And again, we see a split between genotype one and two strains. Genotype one strains have this N to K change at site two. Genotype one strains, again, look more like the old world strains. So just to summarize, only the South American strains are glycosylated at site two. Uh, and there's a difference between the genotype and one and two strains um, uh, you know, in terms of the site 2B, the subsite of, of site 2. Um, importantly, none of the African strains are glycosylated at site 2, and none of them um, also have this N2K change, and none of them also have these mutations at site 1. So we're seeing a very nice split between the old world lineages and the new world lineages, and it's hard to sort of genetically date these because the phylogenies are very shallow, but we can see these changes in South American strains going as far back as we can go in terms of what's available but in terms of sequence. So what this tells us is that these are not recent changes. These are old changes. Maybe the even changes that happened very close to the beginning of when yellow fever arrived in the new world. But this is just a conjecture we don't really know and probably we'll never know. Um, anyway, I'm just this is just summarizing that all of the, the, the new world viruses seem to have the N-linked glycan. All of the old world viruses don't. Um, so what about Bolivia? It's kind of interesting because it's a little different. And so what we actually find when we look at neutralization with Bolivia is that it's, it's, it's intermediate between 17D and ES504, 
we don't completely understand why yet, but we think it has to do with this N to K change at site two, because Bolivia again is black oscillated, but doesn't have this lysine like ES504 does. And so maybe what we're looking at here is the pure contribution of the N link black oscillation site. Although other sites could also be important, we don't know yet. But but we are seeing a pattern where all of the South American strains seem to be similar, you know, in sequence, and two of them from two different genotypes seem to have similar phenotypes as well. Okay, so. Our working hypotheses, um, just to wrap up here, is that differences in neutralizing activity of vaccine, vaccine sera are really driven by neutralizing antibodies that recognize these more complex quaternary epitopes on virus particles. Uh, and those are the antibodies that are really being affected by mutations at the hinged region between domain one and domain two. And we speculate and, and are, are trying to test now that these mutations inhibit viral recognition by, by these types of antibodies, by either directly blocking their binding or indirectly uh, affecting viral dynamics or confirmation in such a way that these antibodies cannot bind anymore. These are very testable propositions that we hope to get more data on in the, in the near future. So to conclude, uh, I mean, what are the larger implications of this thing? That's something that I really look forward to discussing. Of course, our study doesn't prove anything in terms of vaccine efficacy or anything like that. And certainly we didn't look at vaccine efficacy in the study, but I think it's fair to say based on the data that we've generated that um, if you're using the vaccine strain to look at neutralizing activity of vaccine sera in South America, especially in Brazil, you may overestimate the potency of vaccine coverage because simply because the, the, the neutralizing antibody response doesn't seem to work as well against ES504. Um, and, and presumably other strains, although we haven't looked, but they all have the same kind of sequence at that site. So we would predict that they should also behave more similar to ES5, similarly to ES504. Now, of course, it isn't all about neutralizing antibodies. It isn't as if ES504 isn't neutralized. It is neutralized. It's just neutralized less well. Maybe it's neutralized well enough. You know, these are all questions I think we need to address through more work, especially public health surveillance, which, you know, we can't answer all these questions just in the lab. So there's a lot to do there to try and understand these things. Um, and then we, we, um, we, we I, I think, you know, we've shown, although it's indirect so far, that these key vaccine induced antibody specificities that determine this difference in neutralization between the old world and the new world plates, really, we don't know what these antibodies are yet, and we should try and understand what they are. And we also think that, you know, it's helpful to think about these findings in light of a next generation vaccine or updated vaccine. Maybe we don't need it yet. Maybe we'll never need it, but it's just something to think about. Uh, and then finally, I just want to thank everybody that did the work. Um, this is really a large collaboration and uh, collaboration with people, you know, on two continents and the work wouldn't have been possible really without um, uh, Myrna and Esper and all of their teams, um, you know, with whom we work closely to do this. So I'd like to thank folks in my lab and I'll have a couple of slides on that. Um, uh, Simone Sidoli's group, uh, in, here at Einstein, did the mass spectrometry. Uh, Theo Cruz, um, of course, uh, and, and Universidad de Sao Paulo, of course, for uh, all of the, you know, much of the work I showed you with do Brazilian donor samples and looking at authentic neutralization. Uh, our collaboration with Adima, which actually really started all of this work for us um, because uh, helping them looking at neutralizing antibodies from vaccinees. Uh, and then MAPA Pharmaceutical, uh, Crystal and Zach, that provided us with the antigens for E protein. And some of the neutralization data that I showed you was done by Nuria uh, Pedrino Lopez in uh, David Watkins' lab at University of Miami. Um, and then I'd like to thank the folks in my lab that really kind of drove this work. Um, Denise uh, is a research fellow who uh, trained with Karen Stiazny and Franz Heinz in Austria. So she came to the lab as a flavivirus expert. I don't, we, we, we didn't do anything on flavies before she arrived. So she kind of helped to build these projects in the lab. Uh, Alex Say is a is a um, an MD PhD student in the lab who's been working closely with Denise um, on this project and has done a lot of uh, important experiments as part of this work. Uh, and Gorka Lasso, a computational biologist um, who's a research assistant professor in my lab, who um, made this important sort of discovery about the about these site one site two changes that I, I mentioned about. Uh, and of course, my larger group, which um, you know. Uh, this is I need we need a new picture because there are some people on here that are not here anymore and there are some people here that aren't on this picture but um you know we have a really uh, fun and great group so if there are folks that are listening that are interested in uh doing a postdoc for example please uh, send me an email so we can talk because we're actually looking to recruit folks to the lab right now 
And we work on lots of different things, not just flavor viruses. We work on lots of emerging viruses and we take lots of different approaches to solving problems about in virology. So, you know, whatever you like to do, and if you're interested in viruses, we can probably find you something you, you enjoy. So anyway, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and I hope I didn't go over, but I, I will be happy to take uh, any questions or actually, I guess there's a plan for, uh, for discussion after this and I'll let Myrna, let Myrna have the mic here to tell us what happens next. Thank you for excellent talk, Dr. Shandon. And uh, now I start with this part of the discussion section with the, deb the debaters, inviting Dr. Akira home. Please, Dr. Akira. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice presentation, Dr. Shandon. Not Thank you. only very nice, but very important, very important presentation. And uh, as a matter of fact, for me, it's very difficult to understand the entire presentation because <laughs> it's so uh, deep uh, molecular biology study. And I must talk to Mirna later <laughs> to have a more explanation on different uh, aspect of yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, you are bringing very interesting information, very interesting and important information. Uh, so, the question is, uh, we must uh, have a, uh, another look in, in the vaccine efficacy, vaccine uh, effectivity, our vaccine, you know. Uh, as you showed, is a uh, you know Rockefeller Foundation uh, work in this strain back there in eighty more than eighty five years ago with the Azib strain. So oh, and we have it three three CD lots approved by WHO. Okay, two four two thirteen and our seventeen DD. Strain. We are the only lab, one laboratory that produces this 7GG strain. Uh, but for more than eight four, eight, four years, we are producing this vaccine using this strain. Uh, more than 1.3 billion doses was produced already in this age of production. All the uh, operation procedure established. Uh, CD lot system was developed here, you know, at, at that time. So, uh, very long production, very large production, and uh, very few, very few uh, vaccine uh, uh, people immunized and uh, with. Uh, uh, infection, yellow fever infection. I don't know how many, but I think uh, I have seen uh, some report and uh, the showing yellow fever in uh, vaccinated people. Very, but very, very few. So, uh, in the African uh, region, I never. I don't have any information right with this uh, uh, regarding, but uh, in South America, I think uh, I must say uh, that I, I, I must reiterate, we don't have uh, really information, I think good information regarding uh, uh, yellow fever infection in vaccinated people. I think it, it's almost, uh, uh, so we are, we, uh, oh, we had, a very, we were very confident that the, our vaccine is very efficacious. Okay. Very efficacious. And, uh, they, as a matter of fact, we start to make those, those response study mm -hmm. because our vaccine has so high potency, so very high potency. And we 
because you know the requirement by WHO did establish the the the, the high limits high limit you know who, who the WHO has a limit for low uh, the minimum minimum potency no uh, must the vaccine must have a 1000 international unit but not the limit upper limit so we had a uh, our vaccine uh, with uh, five, 50, 50,000 international units, 70,000 international units. So we start, we, we stop and we, we made it. And I, those response study, and we found that if we dilute our vaccine, one thing, and still we had the, the potency for uh, 1,000 international units. So, therefore, when, when uh, uh, there were outbreaks there in Africa and uh, the vaccine was not available, the uh, WHO and we exchanged information and they decided to use fractionate dose. Okay? Uh, this is, and we also used in Brazil fractionated dose because in that is uh, outbreak you showed in the starting, uh, we, we need more vaccine and we use uh, vaccinate those. The question, uh, there are other two big questions. Uh, WHO established, established that uh, one shot is enough for life. But we had it already uh, at that time and we explained to WHO that we had study that show that uh, we need to have a certain dose after uh, some years, especially in children. We vaccinate children after uh, nine months children or uh, one or two years children. After four years or so, or five years, we need to have a second dose. In adults, we need to have a second dose 10 years later. And Tatiana is now uh, involved with this uh, uh, duration uh, uh, of uh, uh, protection of our yellow fever vaccine. And she has already data uh, showing that it, it is required to have a, uh, a second dose. Now she will show some of this information. And uh, okay, but maybe, maybe, with your data, you, your data may, may bring some insights in the protection for, in Africa. For example, uh, uh, African strain, yellow fever strain, well, our vaccine may be protected better. Uh, because they, well, but they showed also, there are studies there in Africa that the, uh, the second dose is also important. I think I have seen some studies. Okay. So anyway, anyway, uh, 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 they are very. It is very interesting what you are you are showing. You are showing. So uh, we had the introduction of with of yellow fever virus in in Americas five five hundred years ago. The uh, central uh, America and then in United States uh, started the 400 years ago, no? something like this. And we had here uh, in, in Brazil uh, in 1850, something like this. So you you are showing that the the Azib strain or the African strain. Uh, African strain introduced in South America during these 400 years has mutated, has changed, has changed. Yes. So the protection may be uh, <coughs> a diversity of is lower using this uh, AZB strain now, you know. Or, with the infection, when infected with the South American strain. Uh, so my question is, 
uh, you, what do you think? You said it. the new vaccine, the new yellow fever vaccine, the interrogation mark there. Not the interrogation mark, you, you, you have it. Uh, very affirmative uh, sentence there. New generation of yellow fever vaccine, or new, new uh, yellow fever vaccine. What kind of vaccine are you thinking about? Is uh, uh, light attenuated vaccine with a new strain or use a new technology like uh, RNA uh, messenger uh, uh, technology or yeah. I mean, I, I guess, yeah, I mean, so there are a few things. One is, I think I have a lot of questions, which, I mean, I think I would love to hear from you because all of you, because you know, on the ground, and, and I'm not a public health person, I'm not an epi person, so this is not really my expertise. Um, yeah, so, I, 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 yeah just, just, just to complete the idea, there are many, there are so many vaccines, new vaccine, yellow fever development, okay? But they are using, they are not uh, taking in consideration the, the South American uh, strain, for example, with all this modification. So there are complications here, and we, we must have it, we must take a look at what is going on, and what is the best way, and we must analyze. Uh, Luciana, Luciana Gaspar, she is working already for 10 years in inactivated, inactivated vaccine, inactivated ELP vaccine because, because there are some important, important side reactions using this vaccine, live strain vaccine, okay? And we knew, we know uh, uh, with the rock, uh, we have uh, some research here uh, uh, with the Rockefeller University, and we uh, it has shown that there are genetic markers, genetic uh, people uh, uh, modification that some people with this, some problem, genetic problem, has sensibility or uh, and has very severe side reaction with our strain on the 17 DD strain uh, and the other yellow fever strain. So, uh, Luciana Gaspar is working with the inactivated vaccine thinking that this inactivated vaccine would avoid this kind of uh, side reaction. But, but, see, with really what Dr. Uh, Hartrick showed, showed that uh, we must take a look at this South American strain. And how about the Asian strain? They will require a vaccine using this Asian strain. And, and the African strain, African strain, uh, will maybe has changed already. There are new strain there, yellow fever strain. You know, it's complicated, very complicated situation we are facing now uh, and you are bringing to this discussion of yellow fever. Uh, I think uh, Tatiana, Luciana, may uh, please uh, uh, add to my comment on, on uh, to Dr. Catrick. Uh, uh, you know, please, Tatiana. Thank you, Dr. Akira. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. I would like to, to thank for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to stay here with you. I'd like to congratulate Dr. Chandran for the brilliant presentation and the very interesting, nice work. If it's difficult to Dr. Akira to understand deeper, imagine for me, I am a medical epidemiologist. So uh, my role he, here is, is to comment about the correlation of your fi findings with our ecological data uh, from surveillance, for passive surveillance in Brazil, and the quick response that we have been seen uh, until these years to outbreak control with our vaccine. Uh, we have been discussed with the Minister of Health, uh, Barro, and WHO 
about the duration of protection to this vaccine, the vaccination schedule, one dose or more than one dose for adults and children. And we have been discussed with them that is necessary to conduct the the uh, the surveillance and more study, the right through disease study here in Brazil to, to better evaluation this response to vaccine. But our perceived date surveillance uh, have shown to us the, the, the importance of vaccine to control the, these outbreaks in Brazil. The yellow fever disease has a, a, an endemic uh, behavior here in Brazil or uh, uh, epidemic uh, waves or, or outbreaks every seven or eight years uh, involved in population that have been not uh, vaccinated before. The last one, the, the, the biggest last one was from 2016 and 2019, especially in the southwest of Brazil, that was not the recommendation area for yellow fever vaccine before. Now, at this moment, we have the whole country with this recommendation and it would be better for us to, to, to better observe the the behavior of disease, uh, if we maintain this, this behavior of the outbreaks every seven or, or eight years, or depending on the, the vaccine covered, we will be observe a different behavior of this disease. So that we have been seen at this moment uh, is the people have not been vaccinated or have been vaccinated for more than 10 years is a committed for two year of fever vaccine following this this viral circulation the virus ex expansion expansion following the ep episodic also the comportment of the virus so we have here at this moment uh, the 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 effectiveness we have shown the effectiveness of the vaccine in the control of outbreak and and the the, the only that dr akira told People have not been vaccinated or vaccinated for more than 10 years, for instance, involved for these diseases. So uh, it's very interesting, this bio the molecular biological study. I understand that we need to, to improve this more, to continue to do this more, and continue to study with the breakthrough disease to better understand this vaccine. But uh, uh, what I would like to, to discuss here, to put here, is that at, until that moment, we don't have epidemiological uh, uh, evidence for the low effectiveness of this yellow fever vaccine here in Brazil with this disease comportment. Having all population vaccinated with high uh, vaccine coverage, we can observe better in the future if we have a, a gap or not in the effectiveness. But until this moment, we don't have evidence about this, but we need to continue to study even to continue with this molecular biological study. My question was the same from Dr. Akira, which kind of vaccine will you propose for us? But I think, I think not ensure that Luciane and Marcos will be conducted this, this kind of discussion better than me. Uh, thank you uh, for the presentation, for the brilliant work and the opportunity to stay here and discuss this with you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I just wanted to say a couple of things. So one, you know, it's, um, I think maybe one simple thing you know that could come out of this is if one were using a neutralization to do surveillance then instead of using the vaccine strain to do surveillance uh, you could look at you could use ES504 and develop uh, a you know a recombinant virus the GFP or I mean you, know, you could you, do, you could develop an assay a reporter assay that you could use to um, look at sort of which I think would be a more realistic assessment of what is a neutralizing activity in people that have been vaccinated. And so maybe, you know, in the longer run of people who haven't been boosted, um, and maybe they're like 20 years away from being vaccinated, that you would, you might see a greater reduction in in antibody titers in people, in those people, if you used like ES504, like all these, a virus with these mutations in the spike protein because that would you know because if you're using only the vaccine strain to look at neutralizing activity then you are getting a higher number than if you're using a brazilian strain so just in terms of surveillance it would make sense leaving aside these questions of vaccine efficacy which are very important which you you and dr gear brought up i mean even just the way you measure i mean i i'm obviously not a public health uh, person, I'm not an epidemiologist, but from a very naive standpoint as a molecular biologist, it seems to me that 
just switching the virus you use to do your reporting, your reporter assays for neutralizing activity in vaccinees would be would be a, a relatively straightforward, should be a relatively straightforward thing to implement that would would maybe give you a different assessment of what the actual titers are. I mean, I think to me, the larger question, which maybe all of you can answer is, what do we know about what is actually needed for protection? I mean, because at least from looking at the literature, there's not that much. There is this old non-human primate study, you know, which suggests that you actually don't need very much neutralizing antibody. Like maybe you only need titers of like one to 10 to get protection in macaques. So is that, is that something that is worth updating or is that maybe because it makes complete sense to me that like you know with covid we're seeing a lot of variants and you know people are getting exposed and getting infected even though they've been vaccinated even though there is still protection against disease um but that's a very different situation because the respiratory virus the antibody that's made has to get into the lungs and provide on the upper respiratory tract in this case you're being bitten by a mosquito and if there's already antibody in the blood that can neutralize incoming virus or in, in the periphery, maybe you don't need much antibody. So to me, that is a really important mechanism, sort of like a question is like, you know, even though the tires are coming down from a thousand to a hundred, maybe we're still tenfold over what we need for protection. And that to me, I don't know the answer to that question. So that's one question I have. I mean, and then the other piece of this for me is, you know, how extensively has it been looked for, have people looked for, uh, for vaccine breakthrough? Um, maybe it's quite rare, um, and it may be happening for some other reason, you know, including people being immunocompromised or what have you. But maybe in the longer run, the way I'm thinking about this is, you know, maybe not right now is not a problem, but maybe is that if the virus, if as you actually increase, like, you know, your the percentage of people that are vaccinated, maybe see more things like breakthrough. And is there some risk in the long run, which nobody can predict, that the virus is already a little resistant to these dominant antibodies that are generated um, by vaccination. So uh, could that become worse over time? So maybe it's not a problem right now, but maybe it's something to keep an eye on for the future. Um, and so then maybe there is a rationale not to do anything crazy because you have a vaccine, as you said, it. You know, you have evidence that it works. It's more important to vaccinate people than to perfect the vaccine. Um, I would certainly agree with that. And so maybe there's nothing to do right now, but maybe there's an opportunity to, to continue to improve the vaccine with an eye to the future, maybe like in a 20 year, 30 year window could be. I mean, I love live attenuated vaccines. I mean, so to me, a very simple thing that you one simple nothing simple of course but one thing you could do to that maybe and of course there would have to be a lot of study in safety and all this but one could in principle take 17 dd and just modify it genetically to incorporate these changes because they're very conserved it's not like covid where there's like all these million variants it's just very conserved and probably i'm guessing has to do with adaptation to a new sylvatic cycle in central and south america there's nothing to do with human antibody evasion it's not a response to vaccination it's clearly something that's very old these genetic changes so if we just tweak the vaccine a little bit the same vaccine 17 dd but just make these small changes in the amino acid sequence of the e protein maybe that's one approach and like dr gira was saying there are people that cannot get the live attenuated vaccine for various reasons so maybe a different modality whether it's a subunit vaccine or an mrna vaccine uh, would you know um, would, would would be would be something good to have just so that you know it most people would still get some kind of 17 dd or some variant of that but um but a few people who cannot get it could get this other vaccine and then maybe monoclonal antibodies a plug i make a plug for monoclonal antibodies <laughs> maybe during an outbreak you know it would be helpful to have prophylactic monoclonal antibodies that could be given to people that cannot be vaccinated um, or that are immunocompromised and cannot mount a vaccine immune response. And we're seeing with COVID that it's important to have that. So anyway, but those are my thoughts. I mean, I'm really looking, deferring to this group, which knows a lot more about, you know, vaccination and its effects on the ground. I mean, my, my knowledge of this is all very theoretical. So, you know, I'm in the, in the reality, of course, is you guys. So, yeah. but uh, these are just my thoughts, of, you know, just Thank for you. consideration. Luciano. 
Do you want to say? Let's keep it. Yes. Let's keep it going with the discussion with you, Dr. Luciani Gaston. Yeah, Marcus, Mark Freire also uh, showed up, but, but the, I think Luciana has a prior. Uh, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mina and Dr. Shanga, for the opportunity to learn with you and for the opportunity to discuss about yellow fever. Uh, Dr. Shander, thank you for the excellent presentation and the very important and interesting work. Um, the current attenuated yellow fever vaccine has a long and solid history of safety, efficacy, and protection. Um, as you mentioned, is the most successful vaccine ever produced and predicted to 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 give a long uh, a lifelong protection. So it's very difficult to think about the possibility of doing updating in this current vaccine. Very difficult. Um, so my question is, my first question is, have the South American uh, virus strains been characterized in terms of uh, virulence? Um, I wonder, how long would it take to obtain such a minimal safe profile uh, for to confirm the attenuation of these new strands? Okay, so as also mentioned by Dr. Akira before, um, I think we should consider this point before thinking about any kind of updating for the current vaccine. Okay, um, so my second question is that uh, you want me to other... answer that do you want me to answer that first yes. or, i mean I, I would argue again like obviously you know there's an expression you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right like one thing we don't want to do and i think when we were trying to write this paper we're trying to be very very careful to be very clear that we're not saying anything about vaccine efficacy the, the last thing we want is for people to feel like the vaccine doesn't work and then not get vaccinated because at the end of the day you have a good vaccine it's just the question is if these are just things to look for in the future and maybe to look out for and maybe prepare in the in the longer term. But um, I would argue that if one were going to modify the current vaccine, one would just take the same virus and just mutate those few sites. Like I, I wouldn't, you know, because as you're saying, if you make much larger changes genetically, like in the non-structural proteins that Dr. Uh, Myrna has like shown, you know, happen, you know, those may have effects on, I mean, you know, then you would have to do this whole attenuation process all over again, right? And or you may have to, right? I mean, you, you may change virulence. I mean, I, I also agree with you that even these small changes may affect virulence. I think it's unlikely, but it's certainly possible. We know there are single amino acid changes. There are also risks to changing how these things behave in the sylvatic cycle. We don't know, right? Like we know for other flavors that a single glycosylation site can have huge effects on mosquito transmission. So we have to be very careful. I completely agree with you on that. And certainly the risk with any kind of live attenuated vaccine is that, you know, there could be effects on virulence. It could be unforeseen effects on transmission. We don't want to take what is a good situation that maybe could be made better and make it worse. So I, you know, you know, the physician's credo is do no harm. I completely agree. But I, I do think it's worth investigating on a research track to understand more, do more studies, do more studies in animals, and really sort of try to build a deeper understanding, but not just at the molecular level, but also in terms of pathogenesis and all these things. So, I mean, you know, so obviously don't, you know, right now the priority should be to make a lot more vaccine that we already have, but in the longer term, I think it's helpful to think about, you know, because there's always room for improvement. So can we make this vaccine better? Uh, do we need to worry, do we want to be ready you know, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. I mean, maybe nothing will happen. This vaccine has been good for a long time, um, but it's not, it's a good exercise, I think, just to think about it anyway, and maybe plan or start doing some work to try and understand if changes could be made. But I completely agree with you on being very careful. So anyway, sorry, you, I don't know if that answered your question and have, uh, happy to clarify okay. or let you ask. Yes, I effort. totally agree with you, Dr. Shun. And it's very important to to maintain the to, to associate genetic chains associated with chains in the yellow fever virulence. 
Okay, it's a target to, to understand. So my second question is about the, the replication of these new strands in mammalian cells, okay? So is the replication profile consistent with vaccine development? I mean, is it possible to get high titers viral in virus cell, for example, because virus cell is a, is a, a, a a cell that is accepted for for vaccine production. Uh, now I'm thinking of obviously in an activated vaccine because here in Biomagins we work with the development of a new inactivated vaccine for yellow fever. So this would be the main point to consider, okay, about uh, to initiate discussion about a possible inactivated vaccine and. Finally, last but not least, my, my third question would be, do you think that uh, RNA vaccine, including the South American virus trans information, could be a good alternative for the development of new generation of vaccine? So, um, so I think I don't know, the, I, don't, I don't have the answer, but uh, what would be the main challenges for this new approach also? Yeah, I mean, there's your second question. I think the person that the perfect person to ask this question is sitting right here in the Zoom room, Dr. Bernaldo, because you know we don't work with the, the authentic virus, right? Like we work with 17D because we don't have a BSL-3 lab. This yeah. is something we would very much like to do uh, going forward. And in fact, we're just getting up our BSL-3 lab up and running. Um, but all of the experiments that I showed you that were done with real ES504 were done by Dr. Bernaldo's group. So. You know, that's I think they did grow very well, but not to, not to as the vaccine virus, uh, a difference of one log. But I think it's enough if you can produce under uh conditions. I mean, one question to ask there would be if you made a molecular clone of 17 DD with just those mutations. Maybe that would grow better because a lot of times the growth really has to do with the internal proteins that's and a good idea, yeah. RNA replication, you know, so, yeah. I mean, that's something that we cannot do, but um, Myrna, you probably could do that and maybe that's something we should talk uh -huh. about. I mean, if there's, I'm not sure what we can do to help with that, but if we can certainly be happy to talk and maybe we can have suggestions on the exact mutations, but um, you know, maybe that would be a really interesting thing to to try and make just to see what happens in the lab. You know how that grows before doing anything more. Yeah, yeah, no. uh, Mark of Fails here. Uh, yeah. Uh, he, he, yeah. He, yes, Mark Freire is a senior scientist here, advisor here, more than forty years uh, in virology and yeah. vaccine development. Yellow fever is one of his. Uh, All kinds of the virus so, Marcus, Marcus, a very short question. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a comment, uh, as you wish. Well, well, first of all, I, I have to com give my congratulations for Dr. Chandra and the the group because we have me and we have Asper, people that have been working with us for a long time. Well, it was fantastic work, very beautiful paper and beautiful pictures and it was fantastic. I had a pleasure to, to read the paper. And one thing that very, very interesting when I, I was reading the paper was to think about this book because it was the other, it was a kid Homer, but the, the point of this book is, is something that we have to say that yellow fever, the disease and the vaccine is in complete history. Then we have a lot to learn about. Then I think he, your contribution is, is fantastic. I think it's something that we have to work more to, to understand better and to know what happened, in fact. Because the question that I have is, Yellow fever vaccine, talk about 70D or 70DD vaccine, 204 or 213, different to the strands, is 80 years old. And we have been using this vaccine for a long, long time in endemic counters and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and like Brazil and the others, 
Bolivia, Peru, and the other countries in Africa, but it's not the point today here. And my question is, if the vaccine didn't work well, how many cases of escape vaccine immunization you should have? And the history that we have, maybe Tatiana know better than me and Akira, how many cases that people that got a vaccine, at least one shot, had been fact in eight years. I think it is a point that you should mention in your paper because is until we know the number of confirmed cases that we have is so few. And most of them there are some some negative point like the vaccine were were not well keep in, in IC or something like that or the immunization was children that or that was not sure immunized and and, and it is my point that the first point is if the vaccine didn't work well for South America strains how many cases of vaccine people would we have including the outbreak that we have in, in 2016-17, that we, we did a plan to, to, so, to immunize people in the, in the, in the outbreak areas, then it is a point that the, uh, we have to understand better to, to say. But I have to agree with you and uh, that when we do the PRNT or um, any other neutralized assay using the homologous and heterologous, the result is different. The paper and if I were to say there's one, only one take home message from this paper that I would completely stand behind, it's that, which is, I, we say in the paper very clearly, we cannot say anything about vaccine efficacy. Sure. The paper does not address this at all because vaccine efficacy is more than antibodies. It's about yeah. T cells. It's about other responses. It's about titers. And I don't have access to data about vaccine breakthrough. You guys do, so you know better than me. So that yeah. that's not really the issue so much as maybe thinking about the future. But but then I would say the one thing for sure I feel like the data point to is when you're testing vaccine zero and doing surveillance, use the homologous strain or at least a South American or a genotype one strain rather than using 17 yeah. dB. When we developed the PRNT, it was in the 90s, we, we tried to use the, the 17 dB virus to be a challenge virus in the, in the assay, but it, it didn't pack well. Mm -hmm. Then we decided to use a, a 204, a 213, in fact, the virus to be a challenge virus in PRT. Mm -hmm. Then it's better because they, they plaque better, but it, but it is still be a virus. virus. Even Asper, we published many papers with Asper using the PRNT that we perform. But sure, we use the homologous because it's difficult to use a, 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 a white type virus in the PRNT. Then, but, it, but it, my question is, when I ask Mila, Mila about the, what is the, the, the virus, if you use the authentic virus, to do some PRNT using authentic virus, then if you really have the tighter degree, okay, they, well, decrease, sorry. And the, and, and it is expect because in 1944, researchers in, use a different virus. African and South America in monkeys, in prime New York world monkeys. Then they, they, what they saw was that the South America virus kill 100% of Brazilian monkeys. When compared with the African monkeys, African, African virus didn't kill the monkeys. Then since there, we know that they are different between the virus. They are different between the virulence. The virulence is completely different. And, but it, 
for sure you should have some difference between between the 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 antibody uh, neutralized antibody let's say but it, but the point is how important is this difference when we really think about protection we don't have correlation of protect for yellow fever until today we don't have nobody yeah, i think that's that's a really important question which ultimately you know just because the titer, you know all we have is a number right like what does that number mean in terms of protection is the important question that needs to be answered in an appropriate model i mean these challenge these experiments are hard to do because it, it's sometimes hard. it's hard to know what the appropriate model is but yeah. you know what we have is something that they try to have is an index of protection then they try but it's not the same it was let's say defining in monkey experiments but it is not true right i had this kind of discussion with bart you had with bart and the tomonas because we don't have but okay but your find is very important when we think about to have for instance a vaccine using let's say subunity of e protein that is it is fantastic because we had been working in transition in using the e protein in plant expression but it may be what what we I, your paper make me, me think is that we have to think it what it will be the best sequence of the e protein i think it is the same when we think about a, a mrna vaccine because maybe we have opportunity to have a right protein to be more protect to have more protection in south america and in africa then then uh, when Lutrakira asked about the what kind of vaccine, I don't know, because you, you yeah. never will have the vaccine with the long last protection like the attenuated strand. Yeah, really? I mean, there's another issue. I mean, you bring up a very important issue, which is something I, I didn't really sort of bring up before when I think Tatiana, you asked me about the mRNA vaccine. Um, so, I mean, I think I'm not a flavivirus expert, but you know, I will say this. It does seem to me, based on the literature, based on what we've done and others, lots of others, is that having particles is incredibly important. Um, you can have subunit vaccines, for example, just domain three of the E protein will elicit lots of neutralizing antibodies. But the problem is that I think in general, those are relatively easy to escape. Um, the advantage of a particle, virus particle based immunogen, like what you have with the live attenuated virus is that you get these complex conformational epitopes that are on the particle on the surface that are maybe harder to escape. Um, and I mean, this is a conjecture, but I'm guessing that that's true. And therefore, delivering a virus particle immunogen through mRNA would not be easy. And so when you try to deliver a recombinant protein, you know, maybe you could make a dimer um, through engineering. But that's not so easy either to, to deliver that through mRNA vaccination. See, you can maybe engineer it in the lab, but making a version that will express properly from, from mRNA in a person could be more complicated. So, so to me, one of the reasons why your, the current vaccines work so well is because they are authentic viruses. And it's not, it's, it's partly the structure and it's, it's probably a big part of it is what you're saying, which is that it's live attenuated. Um, and live attenuated vaccines do tend to give very robust and long-lived protection. So uh, I worry a lot about vaccinating with just a recombinant protein that is maybe just a monomer that doesn't have the structure of the virus, because you're going to get different antibodies in that situation than you would get with the virus immunogen. That's, so the, I didn't mention this in my talk, but the monoclonal antibody data I showed you were all isolated with a, a monomeric antigen. And those antibodies look very different. They are like very focused on site one. Or they are affected by site one mutations, which, by the way, the ES, the Brazilian strains have also those site one mutations. But, but when you look at 17D or 17DD vaccinees, their neutralizing anti antibody titers are highest against, are affected most by site two. So the the, quad, the quaternary binders we think are really, you know, when you get vaccinated with a real flavivirus, you are getting all these quaternary 
more complex binders that are binding to structures on the virus, when you're going to vaccinate with the recombinant subunit protein immunogen, you're going to get a lot of antibodies that are maybe binding to the fusion loops. Maybe you could engineer those out, but there are other liabilities to having those, mo like uh, there's a lot of work to do, I think, there to really engineer subunit vaccines, even aside from how you're going to, it's not just about how you're delivering them, it's about what does the protein look like? And the advantage of 17D and 17DD is, and 204 and all these other viruses that are being used is that they make virus. And yeah. you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, impo it's important. I think. Yeah, yeah our uh, result. Marco, Marco, let, let me ask you, Doctor. First, one one question, additional question mm -hmm. is when you say uh, that the South, uh, the African strain, yellow fever strain, are are genetically distinct from South American strain. You are saying the Aziz strain. Is genetically distinct from South American strain. Sorry, the Azib strain. Which Azib, the Azib strain. You uh -huh. compare the Azib strain with South American strain. Is no, we're comparing part? all. We did experiments with with SCB, but uh, when we're doing the strain comparison, we're looking. So Gorka, uh, the, who did this analysis, he pulled, he scraped the entire database of on GenBank yeah. for all full-length e-protein sequences. So he looked at every available full-length e-protein sequence, and then many of them are identical. So he threw away all of the ones that were identical, and then he just took the ones that were all, at least had one amino acid difference in the e-protein, yeah. and then he broke the tree from that. So it's not yeah. just a CV, it's it's a larger difference that has to do with these two clades yeah. of viruses. Yeah, my point is, does this thing isolated more than eight five years ago may be different from this african today's current strain yellow fever strain you know right but we did look at a lot more recent sequences there are yeah. some other differences but they don't seem to the virus doesn't seem to i mean you know the virus doesn't seem to be that evolving that quickly at the sequence level at least as far as the e-protein goes now obviously there's a lot more to the virus than just the e-protein but um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, to, to finish my, my talk, I, I think uh, fantastic. Um, uh, your what what your paper tell us to pay attention in some some points like we our result in plant based expression e protein it was not so bad, but it, but it, what we we did was to challenge the markets with the the vaccine strength, then we challenge with homologous. Then I think we have to think to study better if you still think about using e protein uh, for for a new vaccine because when it, when we talk about a new vaccine, it's not easier to think about a new attenuated strand, a new attenuated vaccine because it's it will not happen. It's very difficult to have to do, and it's difficult to do a phase three. It's difficult to do a license because I think it, it will be a lot work for cheaper vaccine, and people will tell you that the vaccine that we have is safe and and the efficacy. Then, then, then. It, what we have to think about is a new kind of vaccine that will be not infectious, like mRNA or to be used like particles, like that. maybe or yeah. Then, then, but it, but yeah, maybe. Then I think, but anyway, I think your find was very very interesting for us. Is another a new part of the history of yellow fever vaccine. Thank you a lot. Okay, let's move you on to the audience first, but first I would like to say that uh, Dr. Ricardo Gallia is online with us and it is an honor that they are attending this meeting. Gallia is an excellent biologist and he was uh, a vice director of Bill Manguinhos. Uh, thank you very much, Ricardo. It's a nice pleasure to, to, to attend this, the meeting. Uh, well, I, begin, I, I will begin, begin with the comments. Uh, Fernanda Barreiro says, 
His work raises important questions about the future of the yellow fever vaccine in the Brazilian context. Constant vigilance is required. Thanks for presentation. Joseli Lanes Vieira says, uh, excellent comments by Dr. Akira Roma. How great to hear such a specialist on the yellow fever history in Brazil and other countries. And Elena Caridi, the challenge is, if you, you introduce any modification in vaccine virus strains, it will be necessary to go through new clinical trials and demonstrate efficacy. All right, I, I have a, a lot of questions. I try to, to fuse them to speed up uh, our job here. Okay, uh, the first, uh, you answered on the shock, shock, but I think it, it's uh, important to 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 uh, to to, to, say, uh, to make this question again. Uh, Debbie Fernandes uh, says says uh, thank you for an interesting talk. At the end, what is the contribution of each site, site one and two, to the shift in neutralization of the vaccine series? Is a summa. Hmm? What, what's what's the uh, the real contribution of each site in the shift of neutralization? Um, well, I mean, uh, basically we see both sides contributing, but site two seems to be more important. Okay, uh, I fuse the 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 question of uh, Adriana Valoc and Joseli Lanz. Well, Julie, Julie says, can you comment on toll like receptor activation and cell mediated immune response to this different yellow fever virus? And Adriana Valoc, uh, could you please comment about T cell response induced by the new uh, yellow fever strains? Yeah, I, we haven't looked at that. I mean, that's not something that we do all the time here. So. But I mean, I think these are very important questions because at the end of the day, protection right. is complex and it's not just based on antibodies, although right. antibodies are very important. So how I mean, the innate immune response is stimulated, how did that transition to yeah. what are the T cell epitope? I mean, there are a lot of other genetic changes and, you know, Myrna, you've shown that there are all these changes in non-structural proteins. I mean, yeah. what effects do those have on T cell epitopes? We haven't looked at any of that. I mean, that's not really what we do. But I think that's really important to try and address those kind of questions. Uh, to, to characterize this uh, response in the South American virus, we need good immunologists. So I invite them to uh, to the, the job. Okay. Well, uh, the other nothing. Uh, the the other physical question is. Mariela Martini Gomes uh, asks, are you think about reproducing this polymorphism in an infectious cloning order to confirm variation in epitoprecognition? And Pedro Augusto says, do you think that chimeric virus with some mutations in EPRO based on the yellow fever 70D backbone could be a solution for a new vaccine? But I think the issue is the one that you raised. Any new vaccine is going to have to go through everything again. And, you know, and I think as Mark, as you were saying too, you know, it's quite challenging these days to develop. I mean, this vaccine was made a very long time ago. And the, the idea of essentially walking that same path, I'm sure, is much more complicated now because of safety and perceptions and all of this. So, so yeah, I don't, I mean, again, I'm not, you know, a vaccinologist. I'm also not a, you know, on the ground like you are. So I don't know what's practical or what's realistic. Um, at the molecular level, sure, right? I mean, you, if you could make the virus and it grows well, then in theory, it could be used as a vaccine vector. But in practice, you know, having to to prove that it's still attenuated, having to see, make sure that it can still be manufactured at scale, that it behaves the same, you know, that, it, that it, you know, you, you know, essentially benchmarking production and all of, I mean, all of the things that processes that have to happen, it's a, I'm, 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 I know it's very complicated. So, so you know, and if, if there's a lot more impetus to develop new vaccine platforms for yellow fever, then 
maybe it makes sense then to incorporate these changes into a different vaccine platform rather than trying to do it in the in the attenuated virus. But you know, at least in theory, it, you know, yeah. From a laborat from from the from the standpoint of a laboratorian, it, it it's certainly it's something that's doable. Whether it's practical and doable in the real world, I don't know. I mean, that's that's really more your question than than mine because I don't I don't develop vaccines for a living. So. But it's certainly well, worth considering. It's time, it's time to finish the seminar. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Karkut. I think it, it was a, an excellent presentation and a, an excellent uh, discussion with you, our uh, colleagues of the Bilmanguinhos. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot to the audience with the participation with you. many questions and comments. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and to meet with all of you. And I would love to continue the conversation, of course, with Myrna, but with others uh, here that, you know, because we're very interested in this and we know that there's only, there's not much we can do to help, but if there's anything we can do, uh, even if it's just discussions, I think we'll be very happy to participate in such an important problem, which you guys, of course, are tackling. So, you know, it, it was, Anything we can do to actually contribute in the real world is something that makes us excited. So let us know if we can be of any. Thank you very much, Mirna. Thank you very much, Professor Sharma. Uh, and uh, Rafaela, uh, everybody. It was very nice uh, uh, and the positive information. And, okay. Thank you. See you then. Great. Take care, everybody. Have a good night. Bye. 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 Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, yeah. Thank Bye. you, everybody, for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Uh,